This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond and a very special welcome to Sam Rasool. Uh, class of 2014, mm -hmm. and here it is, 2018. That that makes you uh, uh, almost one of the old timers. Except one of the subjects, Sam, I'd like for you to st start off and tell our viewers about. Uh, there are many of you who are around since 2014. Some a little bit earlier than this big class that came in 2018 mm -hmm. that have formed a new caucus. And I think at first uh, Millennials was being used, but you got another name. So tell the viewers something about this, about this caucus and mm -hmm. about why you have such a caucus. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. We formed a bipartisan, what's called Future Caucus. We joined 21 other states and U.S. Congress to have a Future Caucus here in Virginia. All legislators under the age of 45 are getting together in a bipartisan way to discuss issues affecting uh, future generations, but some issues that are pretty unique maybe to kind of the, the uh, new generations and workforce. So technology, the gig economy, how do we attract and retain some of these younger workers. Um, so having a dynamic conversation around these things, unfortunately we've had a, a pretty good response. Well, and by being 45 and under, you've got a fairly large caucus then. I don't know what your numbers are, but that's. But I could imagine you've got a significant number. Yeah, there are about 30 members of the General Assembly uh, who are 45 and under, and uh, we wanted to bring them together, but not only to discuss policy, but also to break bread together. You know, there are these stories of how um, legislators and, and, and even the, the presidents used to come together with legislators uh, to discuss and actually hash through difficult issues. Uh, so we made, uh, we're making an intentional uh, effort to be able to come together and discuss these issues, but also uh, get to know one another on a personal basis. Oh, well, that'll be an interesting one for the viewers to follow and see how this caucus, because I, I could imagine in another session the, that caucus may come together in a bipartisan way on some legislation. Yeah, we're hoping to come up with a couple pieces of legislation for uh, 2019. Uh, so that would be um, a kind of package that we would think about. I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to co-chair that with my friend, Delegate Chris Peace, uh, so Republican and Democrat, and working together. I've always enjoyed uh, working with him. Well, that's, that's great. Well, tell our viewers, Sam, that we're having a conversation a couple of days before the scheduled day for adjournment. So we, uh, they'll be seeing this after the time that day 60 has come and gone and we'll mm -hmm. know whether, whether there was a budget on time or whether things are extended. So we can't really talk so much about that, but we can talk some about the legislation that were important to you and, and to your constituents. Mm -hmm. And certainly one of the ones that's gotten a great deal of attention has to do with Electric rates, deregulation or not deregulation? Yeah. What's what what has happened, uh, and maybe it's been resolved, or still in these last few days it may still be being worked out. But what what has happened on that this session? Well, um, first, uh, since you mentioned the date, today's um, 
International Women's Day, so Happy yes. International Women's Day. Yes. Yes. Uh, the issue of uh, utility rate deregulation, obviously people are very sensitive to what happens with utility rates. Bottom line is in 2015, uh, we passed one of the worst laws uh, in Virginia history with regards to utility regulation. We allow utilities to be monopolies, and we say that we have one entity that will oversee the utility to make sure that they're not overcharging ratepayers, the State Corporation Commission. And in 2015, we took away the State Corporation Commission's ability to be able to protect ratepayers for a number of years. I thought that that was a terrible move. And so this year we were trying to repeal that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, my piece of legislation, which was a clean repeal, refunding back to the ratepayers what we've overcharged them uh, through the monopolies, uh, did not pass. And instead, a, a bill brought forth largely by the utilities uh, is passing. Uh, and I don't believe that it really improves the status quo at all. So I'll continue to be pushing forward to protect uh, rate payers. It's a very complex piece of legislation that I could um, you know, put, people, put people to sleep over. Right. But the bottom line is, is that utilities will be able to control their accounting, um, which means they can continue to, in my opinion, overcharge rate payers. And I just think that that's not fair. Somewhat related <clears throat> is, is the whole pipeline issue, too. But it's a different issue. I know that's one that's uh, that's been of concern to you and to many others and to and again to your constituents. What's happening on the pipeline? Well, the vice president of the pipeline of one of the pipeline companies EQT said it would be an engineering marvel to bring these two pipelines the largest pipelines in Virginia history to come over those mountains and uh, to do that in a safe way these pipelines would um, really impact, I think, lots of drinking water sources, including mine. Uh, if the pipeline, EQT pipeline, is going to cross over the Roanoke River and its tributaries over 100 times, there's no safe way of building these two pipelines in Virginia without impacting drinking water sources. Of course, there are a number of other issues, environmental and property rights, but for me, it all comes down to drinking water, and I think it's just terrible that these pipelines are coming through. We tried to enact legislation that would um, force the state to own up to uh, its responsibility to protect our water under the, clean, under the federal Clean Water Act. Uh, unfortunately, most of those measures did not pass. One did, but it only will be impacting future pipelines, not the two major ones that are coming through right now. So the ones coming through now, then the, it's federal regulations about the only thing that would be in place, not any particular state ones? Or? No, the state has a lot of authority. Uh, the federal, the, what the federal government does is says, are these pipelines necessary? So the FERC, right. the state is in control of, can these pipelines be safely built, to, uh, built in a way that protects our water? So the state has authority, just as many other states have stopped pipeline projects or not allowed for them to go forward because they feel as though it's going to impact their water. We can and could have done the same. So I'm hoping I'm part of a group of individuals who is currently suing uh, the DEQ and the State Water Control Board for abdicating their responsibility to protect our water. And I think um, my drinking water personally um, could be impacted. We need to do more for sure. Now, some other issues that, that were important to you, uh, community and schools and 16-year-olds voting. Uh, tell, tell us about those issues. Yeah, so just a new conversation here in uh, Virginia. Uh, in some other states, they're allowing 16- and 17-year-olds to vote in local elections. I thought it'd be a great idea to introduce that conversation. We'd have to amend the Virginia Constitution, which is a multi-year process. But imagine being able to uh, engage voters at a very young age, 16 and 17 in high school, getting them involved in local elections. Uh, I think it'd be a great way to go. So I'm hoping uh, we would consider uh, starting next year. 
uh, allowing 16 and 17 year olds uh, to uh, be involved on a, a local level. You know, there have been 18 year olds, a couple I can think of in the eastern part of Virginia that were elect, elected at 18 yeah. to, to local government. And that's at the time of election. They can yes. be campaigning right. at 16 and 17. So I think that it's a great idea to, uh, it'll build good habits early on and hopefully you, you get a more involved uh, electorate uh, as we move forward. Um, and, you know, and, and uh, a number of other pieces of legislation uh, that we've um, brought forward uh, on uh, with regards to election laws, et cetera. But this is one that I thought yeah. uh, be a Very new conversation in Virginia. Very interesting. Now, community and schools, what? Community schools, so there are a couple programs, um, one in Virginia called Communities in Schools, which brings services to schools. And there's a separate uh, identity uh, across the country called Community Schools, ah, and they work yes, together. Okay. Uh, and one is bringing services, but Community Schools is talking about how we plan our schools. Um, and what we want to do is talk about future planning of how we're going to impact our campuses. So that way, imagine a school having a dental office on site or on the campus or the CSB where they're receiving mental health services or counseling there uh, for the students and their families. So to me, we call it the Community Services Efficiency Act mm -hmm. because you're trying to streamline a lot of these community services and, and make sure that the uh, school is the hub of a lot of um, activity. This makes a lot of sense for saving money long term in some of the rural um, localities where census is on the, the decline and they can be use, utilizing some of the excess capacity there. Another issue I know that you've worked on is uh, gun show loophole legislation. What's, what's its status? Yeah, well, all those bills, uh, we, we unfortunately didn't pass any um, progressive um, uh, legislation with regards to gun violence prevention um, and this I speak as a gun owner myself uh, and but there's one with regards to gun trafficking uh, right now we don't it's not the traditional gun show loophole that you you've heard about where people can go and purchase a gun but potentially with no background check at a gun show this is a loophole with regards to the vendors uh, vendors who go to multiple gun shows uh, actually need to be registered as licensed dealers. Uh, the, those that are just doing it casually, uh, you know, once or twice a year, that's one thing. But what we're trying to hit is, you, and you may have seen the pieces done about the gun trafficking that is happening. Yes. And so um, <clears throat> there's a little loophole. We don't know which vendors are regularly selling guns at gun shows. And I'd like to be able to, to close that um, the casual doesn't impact the person who wants to casually be a vendor, um, you know, once or twice a year at their local gun show. We're just trying to find a way to limit these, um, these dealers who are doing it regularly. If they are a federally licensed dealer, then they must conduct these background checks, and it, and it fortunately would, um, uh, you know, limit the number of uh, gun trafficking that is happening. I imagine most of these issues that you've mentioned will be issues that will be back in 2019, and I could imagine that a significant number of them will be part of that uh, Futures Caucus that will be looking at, looking at those two. Yeah, I think we'll, um, community schools, there's some language in the budget about it, so we made some progress there. Uh, we did have one piece of uh, pipeline legislation we hope to, to build on uh, that, did, that did pass as well. Uh, so there are a number of things that have moved forward, but a number of others that need some work. The Future Caucus uh, you know, is all about building consensus, so we'll be figuring right. out ways ha of how we're going to um, maybe handle technology, technological advancements, um, you know, the gig economy, uh, how we're going to uh, you know, conquer some of these challenges uh, in the future uh, for sure. Delegate Rasul, I very much appreciate your being on this week in Richmond. And as you and I were saying before the show started, we need to have a special show 
on another subject, and I, I pledge to you we'll be doing it, and we'd like to get you and, and some of your colleagues on to talk to our viewers about identity theft, because mm -hmm. I know that's something that you know more about than you wish you knew just from your that's personal experience. So we, we will be covering that at a future time, but, okay. but thank you very much for being on this yeah, week in Richmond. Thank you. Thanks for having me, David. It's a delight to welcome Delegate Lamont Bagby to This Week in Richmond. We're having the conversation in this time when the regular session has ended and we're awaiting the reconvene day, but even before that, we're awaiting a, a special session on the budget. So thank you, sir, for being on. And, and tell our viewers, if you would, some about some of the legislation that you worked on during this past session and then What's, what's out there in the future that you're going to be working yeah. on? Thanks, David. Well, as you know, this is my first session as the chair of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. Yes. And so while I was focused on my dozen or so uh, bills, I was also focused on some of the legislation that uh, some of my colleagues on the, um, that are members of the Black Caucus were focused on. And those included, um, of course, you know, our biggest goal was to get Medicaid expansion. And so right. hopeful in this time off, uh, the individuals are working, uh, particularly in appropriations, to make that happen. But also we worked on um, bills such as uh, the classroom to courtroom pipeline. And those bills in, uh, included us working across the aisles uh, with people like um, Dickie Bell and, um, and, and Senator Stanley. Jeff Bourne was, was, a, was a champion of a couple of the bills. Um, and so those bills, along with um, raising the felony threshold, uh, which was, a, you know, work across right. the aisles. I've been for um, a long time. Yeah, worked on. yeah and, and, you know, we're hopeful that um, in the coming years we can increase that a little bit more. Uh, but we are pleased that we were able to make some, um, some adjustment to the, to, to the felony threshold. As you know, it was 200 and it had been 200, I believe, since the 80s. Um, and so uh, it's, 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 it was time to, to increase that. Um, of course, you know I spent a lot of time working on the energy bill um, with, along with uh, uh, the gentleman uh, uh, Kilgore and Wagner and a couple of, uh, uh, of others. And so we, it was a busy session. Um, I think we, we, we got a lot accomplished. Uh, but there's, of course, you know, more, more to be, more to, more to uh, be done, and a, lo a lot left on the table. You know, one of the bills that you had, because you were very gracious in talking about bills that, that your colleagues had, that um, I hadn't really thought about maybe the need for it until you presented the bill. I happened to be there hearing it, and that was the compulsory school attendance bill. Yeah. That that some of us might have thought, of course. With your years on the school board in Henrico County, you knew better. You knew that something needed to be fixed. So tell, tell the viewers so, so about that bill. The compulsory attendance, uh, that, that's a, a tough one for not only um, school systems, but when you, when you really start looking at principals and teachers, they really have a challenge with holding um, parents, to be quite frank with you, accountable for right. school. Right. Students attendance and when that goes before um, the judge uh, when 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 the student uh, is 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 out of compliance uh, or the parent is out of compliance it's often a tough time and so what we were running into is what was on the books was requiring the judges to be a little bit more heavy handed ha heavy handed than they wanted to be and so they were either give the, the parent a heavy-handed uh, consequence or they wouldn't do anything at all. And so we wanted to be a little bit more reasonable with that and not require any um, 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 time served or anything of that nature, but wanted to send a message to parents that it's important to uh, send your child to school. And so the language change was what the judges said that they needed that make, make happen so that the, um, the, 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 the rule was clear. You know, that, that was interesting in listening to the discussion on the committee because, as you were saying, that a parent, I could have said, or a parent could have said, well, I, I told her to go to school, yeah. Yeah. And, and that might have met the mm -hmm. letter of the law until it changed yeah. to really uh, 
to, to require her to go to school. So yeah. just say she, she told me she was going. Never like before I've learned it, being in the legislature is that every word matters. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so, yes. so, so that, that word was critical in changing uh, and making it uh, send the child to school right. um, was important. Well, now, you mentioned, uh, of course, your leadership in the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, and that caucus expanded a little bit after the 2017 elections. Yes, uh, you know, we, we, we got our numbers up to 21, and then we also um, recruited uh, Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax, so we're 22 members strong, uh, and I, th I don't think we've ever been that high in numbers, and so that is a, that is a good thing. Yes, and and some quite a few of those are, are they say are freshmen. I mean, from from I guess the youngest one, uh, Jay Jones. Yes. From Norfolk to, to yeah. others. And yeah, Jay Jones, uh, Jennifer Carroll Foy, and Hala Ayala. Yes, yes, and the lieutenant governor. And the lieutenant governor. The lieutenant governor said. Now, as you uh, look toward the reconvene day, are there matters, education matters, or other things that uh, got any of your attention for that April 18th reconvene time? We let our viewers know, it, hopefully they're following it, there'll be a coming in a week earlier for special session on the budget, and then whatever's happening on that on the 18th, you go into a reconvene day to look at, at what the governor's sending down. So what we're really focused on is a, a few things. Of course, Medicaid expansion. We're also hopeful that we will have um, funding it in, in the budget uh, related to um, food deserts and combating food deserts. Uh, and then the third thing is also we want to make sure that the funding that uh, is allocated for new construction at Virginia State and Norfolk State remains in the budget. And uh, in addition to those critical areas, I'm thinking too that in the House, in the former budget, the bill that's gone now, the House mm -hmm. budget, that it had some additional millions of dollars to try to get more teachers into the pipeline. Sure. And, and uh, at, at all levels and from, uh, particularly in, uh, in I guess those, those areas where it's hard to find teachers. Yeah, and, and so that's always a, a good thing, whether it's raising the, uh, the salaries of teachers or lowering class sizes. I think there's a number of things that we have to do um, because we spent a lot of time talking about uh, how we can combat uh, teachers leaving the classroom. Uh, but I think the best way to do it is to uh, compensate them and also lower class sizes. But we also need to make sure that we provide the resources to teachers, particularly in those highly impoverished areas, uh, to support children in behavior and mental health support. And to go back for just a moment, because one of those bills that you mentioned as you went through that list of, of good bills, um, is one very important throughout the Commonwealth about children who get into some difficulty mm -hmm. not being suspended for a, for a tremendously long time, which gets them out of the whole education uh -oh. process. And I think you referred to it as the uh, the prison pipeline that sometimes is created a lot by, by, I guess, by expelling students. Yeah, so, so Jeff Bourne has had a bill uh, that, that focused on expulsion. And as a school, former school board member, I remember being in the room with the, with the family talking about a uh, child being potentially expelled. And that, those were the toughest decisions we would make because uh, those would require over 365 days of the child being out of the classroom. Well, you also have an opportunity or a, 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 um, a tool in the toolkit of long-term suspension. And so what Jeff Bourne bill did, it was back off 364 days for long-term suspension and brought that down to 45 days. I think anything longer than that is way too long for a child that particularly, have, particularly has behavior issues to be away from the classroom because they, they continue to have uh, no support re related to instruction, but also no support related to behavior. Uh, and so in order for us to, to really combat the challenges and, and the issues that the child is facing, I think the school system and the school is the best place for them to be. And then Stanley had a bill that just simply says that a child pre-K through third grade 
couldn't be suspended for over three days. And so uh, those were the two bills that passed this year, and I think they were uh, two good bills. And, yes. and, they, and, and we work with uh, organizations like the VEA and the Superintendents Association and, and other uh, uh, associations, school board associations, to, to, to find some uh, agreement in those bills. Dr. Bagby, thank you very much for the report, and thank you very much for being on This Week in Richmond. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by The Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Uh -huh.